Hi, this is Dr. Kat Thies from Central New Mexico Community College. We've made it to video K, and here we're going to just summarize everything we learned about how GFR is regulated in the kidneys. So here goes. Glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, is regulated by two mechanisms. We call them intrinsic mechanisms or autoregulatory mechanisms or even local mechanisms versus extrinsic mechanisms. The extrinsic mechanisms include the hormonal mechanism, namely your renin-angiotensin-aldosterone mechanism and the sympathetic nervous system. Let's first take a look at our local mechanisms, of which there are two, the myogenic mechanism that you were already introduced to in the cardiovascular system, where the smooth muscle in the walls of arterioles will respond to either being stretched or not, and in that way try to protect the capillaries. And then there is the tubuloglomerular mechanism, where the macula densa cells are playing a role in constantly detecting the solute concentration as well as the, the flow rate in the distal convoluted tubule. Remember that your intrinsic mechanisms or your local mechanisms, which are autoregulatory, they're the ones that are operating from minute to minute in an attempt to keep the GFR relatively constant in our kidneys. So they're not going to be able to do that when the body is under chronic uh, stress, as in uh, chronically struggling with a low blood pressure or suddenly dealing with a severe low blood pressure. And that's when the extrinsic mechanisms will have to kick in. But let's first take a closer look at the myogenic mechanism and the tubuloglomerular mechanism. And so let's assume that we're dealing with a dropping uh, blood pressure in the body, which translates in a dropping blood pressure in the renal vessels. And this is a dropping blood pressure within our range of about 80 to 180 millimeters of mercury, which is a normal range when we're dealing with daily activities. Okay. Of course, if the blood pressure is dropping, then that means that our G GFR is dropping as well. So our goal now is to bring that GFR back up, right? So that's going to be our goal here, is to bring the GFR back up to homeostatic levels. And our intrinsic mechanisms impact the GFR directly. So if we focus on the myogenic mechanism first, and we keep in mind that our blood pressure is dropping, um, then that translates into the smooth muscle of the vessels that are part of our kidneys not being stretched. And consequently, in order to maintain the flow within the glomerulus, we're going to see that the afferent arterioles in particular are going to want to dilate, because when they dilate, they're going to allow for more blood to enter into the glomerulus, and of course, that is going to increase the GFR. The tubuloglomerular mechanism operates similarly, again, meaning that we're needing vasodilation of the afferent arterioles to occur to bring up GFR, but this time it is due to the macula densa cells that detect that filtrate flow rate is low, or solute concentration is low, particularly sodium. Um, let me write that in here. Sodium in particular. And of course, these macula densa cells are part of the juxtaglomerular apparatus. More specifically, they're part of the distal convoluted tubule. And so when these macula densa cells detect uh, these issues in the distal convoluted tubule, they will then trigger uh, the release of a chemical that can act as a vasodilator or a chemical that will prevent vasoconstriction. You can look at it either way and that's going to bring up our GFR. But again, these intrinsic mechanisms, they can only operate 
when the blood pressure is fluctuating between 80 and 180 millimeters of mercury, more or less, right? So our daily activities, first, you know, sitting in a chair listening to a lecture, then getting up to, um, to get going and grab lunch, make lunch, pick up the kids, uh, things like that. Now let's take a look at what's going to happen um, with the extrinsic mechanisms when we see uh, a, a continuous drop in our blood pressure or a really serious fast drop in the blood pressure. So let's think of the following scenario as we first discuss the, the neural mechanism. <clears throat> let's say that your patient is suffering from internal bleeding. Perhaps your patient had surgery um, and something didn't go right uh, after the surgery to where there is some bleeding going on. That's going to lead to uh, a much lower blood pressure again, with, which leads to a drop in GFR. And the baroreceptors, remember, in the carotid sinus and the aortic sinus are going to detect this because they're not going to uh, feel any kind of a stretch anymore. So if they don't feel a stretch in the vessels, they're alerted to the fact that the blood pressure is too low in the body. And so consequently, these baroreceptors via sensory neurons send signals into the vasomotor center and the vasomotor center then gets the sympathetic nervous system going. Not just your sympathetic fibers, which secrete norepinephrine, but also the adrenal medulla, which secretes uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine, right? So we're going to be releasing the, these neurotransmitters slash hormones into the blood. And these are um, chemicals that, can, that are pretty potent vasoconstrictors, particularly impacting the systemic arterioles. Peripheral resistance is going to rise. And of course, that brings up our blood pressure. And if we bring up our blood pressure, we bring up our GFR. So the extrinsic mechanisms are completely hyper-focused on bringing up blood pressure. And as a consequence, they can then fix the GFR, usually. On the other hand, intrinsic mechanisms directly impact the GFR. Now, there's something else the sympathetic nervous system can do, and that is it can actually communicate right here with the juxtaglomerular cells. And of course, if they are activated, that means that our hormonal mechanism will kick in. And this is more of a long-term mechanism. It is slower and more long-term um, because hormones are involved. So how does this work? So Lots of arrows here. Let's take a look. When blood pressure drops, the juxtaglomerular cells of the juxtaglomerular apparatus, which are your modified smooth muscle cells in the afferent arterial in particular, are not being stretched. And so that triggers them to release the renin that is stored in those granules. And of course, the renin then gets dumped into the blood and eventually um, after, with the help from the liver and the lungs, as we learned in the previous slide, we um, end up with angiotensin II. And as we saw too, angiotensin II will then um, start acting as a systemic vasoconstrictor, which then, of course, brings up our blood pressure and therefore GFR. It can trigger the thirst center so that we bring up blood volume that way. It can trigger the release of ADH from the posterior pituitary so that we see much more water reabsorbed in the kidneys by the insertion of aquaporins into the renal tubules. It's also going to trigger the release of aldosterone, this time from the adrenal gland, the, the adrenal cortex area of the gland. Aldosterone is going to uh, promote the kidneys to reabsorb or trigger the kidneys to reabsorb more sodium. And of course, water will follow, which again increases blood volume, that increases blood pressure, and that brings up our GFR. And finally, angiotensin II can actually also feed back to the juxtaglomerular cells uh, 
to continue the release of renin. So there's a bit of a, a positive feedback mechanism going on right here. Now, as mentioned before, the sympathetic nervous system can communicate with the juxtaglomerular cells, but notice too that our macula densa cells can actually also communicate with the juxtaglomerular cells. So lots of interactions occurring between all the different parts of um, the body. Now, why is it that the intrinsic mechanism can't easily fix the GFR when blood pressure begins to drop too much? Well, imagine this. Blood pressure continues to drop, continues to drop. There's only so much vasodilation that the afferent arterioles can go through. So there comes a point in time, or there comes a point in, in the, the blood pressure level that is so low that dilation of those afferent arterioles is just not going to be enough anymore to fix the GFR. Uh, you know, a vessel can only stretch out so much. And that's why our other mechanisms, our extrinsic mechanisms, are going to have, have to help out. I'm going to add uh, a couple more things here. First of all, angiotensin II is going to be a vasoconstrictor of systemic arterioles indeed. But remember too, and I'm going to squeeze this in, I didn't want to put it on the actual original diagram, but I'm going to squeeze this in, in this time. Angiotensin II is also, also has quite a few uh, receptors on um, the efferent arterioles, so it causes constriction of the efferent arterioles in the kidneys. And of course, that's going to uh, cause a backup of the blood into the glomerulus, and that then directly impacts the GFR that way. Final thing to remind you of, remember that ADH is also called vasopressin and because of this we remember that it also plays a very important role in systemic vasoconstriction, so we may as well put an arrow there as well. So you can see that this is a pretty complex regulatory mechanism, that is GFR regulation, with many different organs involved and much interaction between the various mechanisms. So you were introduced to two major hormones in addition to angiotensin II in our discussion on blood pressure regulation in the kidneys. So let's take a closer look at these and let's get started with aldosterone. Aldosterone is going to be released um, when it's triggered by angiotensin II, especially when blood pressure is dropping but it's also a hormone that can respond to dropping levels of sodium and along with that we typically see increasing levels of potassium in the blood. So aldosterone is released when we suffer from something called hyponatremia. Remember hypo means low. Natrium is really how we refer to sodium in most other languages, and then emia, you know, means blood. Hyponatremia, when blood, less, blood levels of sodium is low. While at the same time, typically we then also see that there is too much potassium in the blood. Most languages say calcium rather than potassium in English. So when we see these two scenarios occurring in the blood, um, aldosterone is going to be triggered to be released from the adrenal gland that sits just on top of the kidneys and more specifically from the cortex of that adrenal gland. Keep in mind that when blood sodium levels are dropping, it could imply too that the blood is not holding on to enough water and automatically therefore we see a drop in blood pressure. And ultimately, the aldosterone is going to target the kidney tubules, telling the kidney tubules or binding to the kidney tubule cells uh, such that a mechanism kicks in that triggers more reabsorption of sodium while we get rid of potassium. And that normalizes our sodium and potassium levels again.
So sodium and potassium typically in the blood have opposite directions of how they are regulated. Very, very important uh, electrolytes in the body that you will keep an eye on all the time in your patients. Antidiuretic hormone, which is released by the posterior pituitary, so totally different location than the adrenal cortex, is going to be released when there is too much sodium in our blood. So when we suffer from hypernatremia, and of course, it's a way to, to literally dilute the blood because what ADH is going to do when it binds to specific cells in the renal tubules of the kidneys, it has the ability to trigger the building of what is called aquaporins, which are specialized water channels. And they are built and then taken apart and built and, take, and taken apart. So they're, they can be formed as needed in the cells of the renal tubules, and they will be built in response to the binding of ADH. And they're really interesting channels that have just in the last, I don't know, decade or, or 20 years been uh, discovered and really studied in great detail to where we now understand that they have the capability of allowing water to move. And of course, water always moves by means of osmosis, uh, passive transport, without um, losing our electrolytes. The other, the other um, reason for why we need to be discussing ADH is because it can, if not enough of it is produced, it can lead to a form of diabetes called diabetes insipidus. Now, this is a very different diabetes than what you are used to when you hear people having uh, diabetes that doesn't regulate their sugar levels anymore. Diabetes insipidus is a disease or uh, a condition that results from either low levels or maybe no levels of ADH in the body. If, and of course this could be due to the, or we could also say that for some reason the ADH can bind to the receptor cells. So those are all possible scenarios. ADH might not be released because there is a problem with the pituitary. Perhaps there is a tumor. Perhaps a person fell hard on their head and their pituitary has been injured. The mechanism that makes ADH is not working properly. Maybe there's a genetic condition. Um, or, as I said, the ADH just cannot bind because the receptors are not there. The receptors are not built properly. Uh, there's many different reasons for why this, this might be the case. But let's assume that a person cannot have enough ADH in their blood or can't have enough ADH bind to these renal tubular cells. What consequences does that have? Well, it means that water from the filtrate that is about to become urine cannot be returned to our blood. Remember, we call that reabsorption. And consequently, we end up with a very, very watery urine. So a very typical symptom or two very typical symptoms of a person with diabetes, so remember this, is excessive urination and excessive drinking, right? These people are constantly thirsty and they can never seem to be able to rehydrate because they're constantly also urinating uh, just because their blood cannot reclaim all of this water that ends up in the filtrate. Now, I haven't brought up this hormone, atrionatriuretic peptide, or you can call it factor or hormone, uh, in this particular video, but we have learned about it before. Remember, this is a hormone that is going to um, respond to a high blood pressure or high blood volume, and it'll therefore respond, and as a consequence, when it's released, it's going to bring down blood pressure.
when blood arrives in the atria of the heart with too high of a pressure, that's going to stimulate the atria to release this hormone, atrial natriuretic peptide, and then it's going to prevent the reabsorption of sodium by literally inhibiting aldosterone. And of course, aldosterone likes to reabsorb water, so if it can't in the kidneys reabsorb, uh, I'm sorry, salt, then we're going to also see that our blood volume will go down and our blood pressure will go down. But A and P can also impact ADH, which then directly impacts the reabsorption of water such that our blood pressure goes down. And it can also impact the release of renin. So ultimately, you can think of A and P as the big inhibitor of the whole RAA mechanism. And therefore, a and P is going to bring our blood pressure down while all these other hormones, aldosterone, ADH, uh, angiotensin, all of them are going to be geared towards bringing the blood pressure up. All right, so we're finally done with discussing filtration in the kidneys, which remember only occurs in the renal corpuscle which is located in the cortex of our kidneys. We're now going to move on to the process of reabsorption and eventually secretion as well. So to make this whole discussion of GFR regulation a little bit more interesting to all of you, let's take a look at a medication that is very often prescribed to patients who suffer from hypertension or chronic high blood pressure. And the name of these medications are going to be ACE inhibitors. You know, they'll have various specific names, but collectively we can call them ACE inhibitors. Recall that ACE stands for angiotensin converting enzyme, and it's produced by the lungs, by the alveoli in particular, and it helps with the conversion of angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2. Of course, we needed renin from the kidneys in order to convert, I'll just put K for kidneys, to convert angiotensinogen produced by the liver, liver, L for liver, into angiotensin 1. So if we can block something along this whole path, then we can impact the regulation of blood pressure. So if this patient is suffering from too high of a blood pressure and we give this patient this drug that can block the actions or prevent or make it more difficult for this enzyme to convert angiotensin 1 into angiotensin 2, clearly we can therefore uh, drop this patient's blood pressure and that's also going to therefore take care of the glomerular filtration rate. So make sure that you can relate all these different puzzle pieces that you've learned about in, in the respiratory system you learned about ACE and where it was produced and what it did. You've learned earlier on already, especially in the blood vessel chapter, uh, about the RAA mechanism, maybe not in such great detail, but you had already been introduced but to angiotensin II. So it's important to pull all of that information together when you take care of your patients, particularly when you're prescribing or where, when you're administering medications to them, sometimes patients really need to have a better understanding of why they're taking the medication because that, will, that might be an incentive for, for them to continue taking that medication. Um, I'm a firm believer in you understanding how things work and also that you will educate your patients in how things work because that will therefore convince them more in continuing with their important medication. So that's the end of this particular video.